More than 4 billion people live across this vast continent called Asia, and we are telling their stories. On this edition, mountains of garbage, threatening to overwhelm and even engulf Lebanon. Having ready access to clean water in some of Cambodia's poorest rural communities. I'm Natalie Carney, and this is Assignment Asia. Welcome to the program. In 2015, Lebanon erupted in protest after streets and public places were littered with trash due to a suspension in garbage collection. Even though the problem was thought to have been solved by hiring local contractors, it turned out that the garbage was simply moved to coastal landfills or even dumped into the sea. As I found out, activists are saying the pollution is not only hurting the environment, but also people's livelihoods and health. There's no time to waste. Lebanon needs to sort its crippling garbage problem. After the government closed a huge landfill in 2015 without an alternative, dumping and burning waste on the streets has become widespread. From overflowing trash bins to littered sidewalks, garbage can be seen everywhere, on streets, in public parks, and even beaches. In a country once renowned for its beauty, Lebanon is no longer what it used to be. We're here at a garbage dump in the town of Sidon, just south of Beirut. Many of Lebanon's garbage dumps are along its beautiful coastline. The problem being, with the garbage not being adequately dealt with over the last few years, it's mounting and much of it is ending up in the sea. Wind, rain and climbing garbage piles leads to garbage falling into the water. Local fishermen whose boats sit just below a garbage dump say they have also witnessed trucks dumping the trash directly into the sea. This beach in the Zouk Mosbe district, just north of Beirut, was once a popular swimming spot for Lebanese families. It's now one of the worst victims of the city's waste crisis, as coastal dumps are being pushed to their limits. Jocelyn Kedi is the founder of Recycle Lebanon, an NGO she started in response to her country's national waste crisis. Her team educates the community about recycling and works with them to find solutions. This isn't only at this beach. This is the state across the Lebanese coastline, inside our mountains, inside our rivers. But this beach is an awakening, wake-up call to say, I'm sick. According to some reports, by 2016, an estimated 2 million metric tons of waste sat along Lebanon's coast. As the rubbish spilled into public spaces, so did the public, demanding the government do more. Doctors say there are very serious health concerns with all this garbage out in the open. Given the high number of cancer cases in the country, Dr. Rania says scientists have started to research the connection between the garbage and toxic gases. But the risks are also coming from the garbage being dumped into the sea. Once the humans will eat the fishes, all the microplastics and toxins will enter our body. It can cause cancers in the gastrointestinal system, but also as it's, it's going to spread in all the body, it can cause somewhere else cancers. Local fishermen have taken pictures of contaminated and dead fishes. It's affecting their livelihood. <laughs> More than 2,000 people have taken part in beach cleanups with Recycle Lebanon. What is this? Oh, it's a bathroom mat. While a variety of items have been found, what disturbed them the most was the flattened plastic water bottles. Bottles 
where it looked like the public had recycled it. They'd smashed it, they had removed the cap of it, and we saw a large quantity of this, and we understood that the people did think that they were recycling. But they didn't understand that when they recycled with the governments, it was going directly into the sea, into the landfills, and right back into our system. <laughs> Dr. Joseph Al Asman is an advisor to the Ministry of Environment in Lebanon and says the government understands the magnitude of the problem. We suggested to rehabilitate the dumps. We have uh, around 940 random dumps. The garbage that are in the dumps. It, uh, they can be uh, diverted to maybe some uh, landfills or maybe they can be recycled. The solution of the ministry is to increase the recycling. So we have two main factories for recycling. So we, have, we ask them to develop them and the government accepted this. Such a project would require at least $20 million urgently and a further $55 million to keep it going, he says. Money the government may not want to allocate due to the country's struggling economy. To make things worse, Lebanon's centralized waste management recycling system has very little sorting capacities. Therefore, the government has decentralized the process, leaving it up to the individual municipalities and local citizens to set up their own initiatives. Recycling in Lebanon has largely been left to the NGOs and civil society groups. And nowhere is that more apparent than here at Recycle Beirut. Here we have paper, here we have uh, metal, we have different kinds of, of plastics. There is a uh, hard plastic, this is uh, cardboard. Cardboard is different than uh, paper. The glass here, here the aluminium, here the cans, here the tin. If you want to solve the garbage crisis, you need to start with recycling. Asim Kazak is the CEO of Recycle Beirut, a local business that collects recyclables from households, businesses, universities, and anywhere else, really, across the city. He says the government has no recycling system. The government is uh, collecting everything, they compress them. And when you compress stuff together, so it's very hard to separate them again, you know? So, it's, of course, they go to somewhere that is, I hope, the landfill. <laughs> Azim says this has led to more and more people signing up to recycle Beirut daily, such as Nida, who frequently drops off bottles from the school where she works. Since the government is not doing anything, you know, I found Recycle Beirut on the website because we, you walk around Lebanon and you see everybody throwing garbage and nobody's recycling and uh, the people are not uh, being taught, they're not aware of how uh, dangerous it is for the, um, uh, for us not to recycle. Recycle Beirut collects and sorts each item separately and then sells the raw materials to individuals or companies who reuse it to manufacture new products. One such manufacturer is Waste Studio. And it fits perfectly in the... Waste Studio takes expired advertising banners and turns them into stylish fashion accessories. To reuse advertising banners, leftovers of boat covers, uh, leftovers of seat belts. We reuse also uh, bicycle and car and the truck inner tubing. It's reducing a lot from the landfill and it's reducing a lot for the environment because the advertising banners are not even recyclable. Walid's waste reduction bags, wallets and cases are being sold all over the world. Dr. Al Asman says incinerators are the best option for now. In fact, the incinerators, especially in the uh, saturated areas like Beirut, like Tripoli, are in need because we don't have enough areas to manage our garbage. So we need to uh, decrease the volume and the mass of these garbages. So for this reason, we need incinerators. In September of 2018, Lebanon's parliament ratified a ruling to build three incinerators in the country at a cost of over $1 billion. The public outcry has been fierce. Until a solution is available, the Lebanese people will continue to bear the consequences.
Lebanon's garbage crisis is threatening the entire Mediterranean environment and putting the country at risk of violating the 1995 Barcelona Convention aimed at protecting the marine environment and coastal region of the sea. We are under obligation inside the Barcelona Convention with the Paris Climate Act. We are inside the Lebanese environmental laws and we're still dumping waste directly into the sea and we are still drafting a law from the Ministry of Energy that's going to give licensing to incinerators so that they can create energy and take it off. I mean, it's madness. Also at risk is the country's reputation. Once considered the Paris of the Middle East for its elegance, style, and beauty, Lebanon is now on the verge of being considered the world's largest dumping ground for its public garbage, smell, and pollution. Though daunting, some say the garbage crisis has brought the Lebanese people closer. Despite sectarian divisions, many have come together to try to find innovative ways to bring about a cleaner environment. Next on Assignment Asia, making clean water available to every household. Stories of hope. Triumph, innovation, and change. We uncover the truth and go great lengths to tell a story. Get to know ordinary people with extraordinary stories and see Asia from an Asian perspective. This is Assignment Asia. Expect the unexpected. time, potable water has been but a dream for many parts of Cambodia, where people often die of diseases caused by contaminated water. But the situation is changing. Martin Lowe reports from Cambodia on the strides the country is taking to bring clean water to its people. Like so many others, this well is almost dry. The little water that remains is far from clean. But for people living in rural Cambodia, open wells are often the only source of water. Villagers come to wells like this one in Siem Reap to fill their containers and carry them home. her water from the well. It's three kilometers from her house in Songver village. After she struggles to get back, she stores it in stone pots. With water straight from the ground, boiling is the only way she has to try to get rid of bacteria. <laughs> Figures release 
released by the World Bank in 2008 revealed that almost 10,000 Cambodians, including thousands of young children, die each year from diseases such as dysentery and diarrhea caused by drinking dirty water. This is a country that has never been far from tragedy. In the past, it's been ravaged by war. It's still littered with landmines. Poverty is a constant problem. But right now, the lack of clean water is the number one issue, with all of the social and health implications that it brings. But things are changing. The United Nations set Cambodia a target to supply clean water to at least half of its rural population by the end of 2015. It was called a Millennium Goal, and the target was met. Here at Piekspia village nearby, they had to dig deep, 250 meters to find water. Underground water isn't affected by surface contamination and is cleaner than groundwater. The water's pumped up high to a tower, so there's enough pressure to deliver it by plastic pipe to nearby homes. For the first time in her life, 60-year-old Tuwok has water from a tap. All she has to do is run it through a filter, and it's safe to drink. គឺយើងនៅលដៅនេះនេះគឺចេញយប់ឡើងគឺម៉ោងដប់ពីរយប់បានក្រោកទៅដងបានបានទឹកម៉ោងចាហើយនៅក្នុងភូមិនេះនេ
In the wet season, from May to October, people collect rainwater. They try to make it last the next six dry months. But in recent years, there's been less rain. Many believe a result of global warming, and the streams dry up more quickly. Where there is water, like here at Stung Chikreng River, people wash themselves and their clothes. But they also use the same water for drinking and cooking. Now, a $44 million dam is being built. It'll create a vast reservoir, and more than 100 kilometers of canals will carry it to where it's most needed for public consumption and crop irrigation. The work's being carried out by a Chinese company with expertise not available in Cambodia, funded by a low-cost Chinese loan. But in other places, the water has simply disappeared. This is West Barai, a reservoir on the outskirts of Siem Reap city. It's been here hundreds of years. No one's ever seen it like this before. When there's plenty of rainfall, this enormous reservoir would be full of water, in some places 10 meters deep. Today, as far as the eye can see, it's almost completely empty. On land normally underwater, they're growing rice. Nearby, the wells and waterways are also dry, and people are going thirsty. Cambodian authorities have begun emergency water deliveries, something unheard of in the past. Before, people had to cope as best they could. Tankers carry clean water to affected areas and distribute it to those in need. But, uh, ដោយក្នុងពិភពលោកក៏ដូចជាក្នុងក្នុងដំបន់ហើយក្នុងលោកនៅក្នុងខេត្តសិមរាបហើយដោយឡែកនៅក្នុងក្រុងសិមរាប
All around there are trees and bushes. This is where people go to the toilet. In some villages, 80% of people have never used a formal toilet or latrine. Even now, when toilets are starting to be built, most people don't use them. It's simply not natural for them. But human waste is toxic. Just one gram can contain millions of viruses. A programme to educate people about health risks has been launched, but it'll take time to change the habits of generations. Much progress has been made, but there's still more to do. The government hopes to make clean water available to every household within a decade. Many doubted Cambodia would come this far. That millennium goal seemed out of reach just five years ago. But a determined effort by government, banks, countries, charities, NGOs, even individuals, has seen great advances. The United Nations has declared access to clean water a basic human right. It's a right more and more Cambodians are now enjoying than ever before. For Assignment Asia, I'm Martin Lowe in Northern Cambodia. The Cambodian government says it still has a long way to go, as at least half of the country's rural population lacks access to clean water. And that's all the time we have for this week's program. I'm Natalie Carney. Thanks for watching. And join us again for another episode of Assignment Asia. Share your thoughts and contribute story ideas for future shows by contacting us on social media.